The webinar today, welcome Lara Bazelon, who is the author of Ambitious Like a Mother, which I devoured last weekend. And I really enjoy the secondary line right down here, which is why prioritizing your career is good for your kids. I personally feel this today with one of my kids homesick, who's like yelling in the, out next to me about like, can I have a salad? And I'm like, I know you're sick, just be quiet. This is the focus of my attention right now. And I feel no guilt about it whatsoever. But this is an incredible book because it's really personal to you. And this is not your full-time day career, but writing about women and writing about motherhood and ambition is something that's super personal to you and has become like sort of your secondary career. And I love the book because it, it's about mothers and motherhood and generational feminism and the role models and the, the impressions that we get from the women in our life and how those, those imprints really change the course of the succeeding generations. And, and I thought it was beautifully written. So I just wanna know, how did you come to it and how did your, this, your own mother's story and her story affect you and start, you and start the process of you writing this book? First of all, thank you for having me. And I'm really excited to be here. And even though I can't see the participants, a warm hello to all of you. And I look forward to any questions that you have. You can really ask me anything. I got started on this book because I wrote this op-ed for the New York Times in 2019. And I didn't pick the headline, the writers never do, but the New York Times did. And the headline was, I have picked my job over my kids. And it told the story of how women are always expected to live their lives in perfect balance. And the truth is that none of us can or do. And then it kind of told a bit of a, a personal story of sort of my own struggles with balance and imbalance. And it went viral. And I just was inundated by messages from women across the country who read that piece and just responded to it. And so it occurred to me that there might really be a full book there. And so I kind of backed up um, kind of zoomed out and thought like what who inspired me really to make the kinds of choices that I've made and truly it was my own mom who was really a pioneer for her time she went to medical school in the 1960s and pursued an education very avidly even after she got married and that was in part I think because of her experience growing up where her father had died tragically when she was three and she and her mother had struggled economically basically for my mother's entire life. Her, her mother was virtually unable to make a living. And so my mom always drove home the idea that it was important to be able to support yourself and your kids. And then my parents were those 1970 free to be you and me feminists who told my sisters and me, they had four children, all girls, that we could be anything we wanted. And so it was kind of those twin lessons that were imprinted on me that kind of led me down the path that I took. And tell everyone the path you took because it's a pretty spectacular path. So I, I went to law school and I went to law school because I really wanted to represent people who had no voice, who, who were poor and didn't really have anybody else. And that work led me to representing people who had been wrongfully convicted. And this was part of my transitioning from being a full-time trial lawyer to being an academic. But the kind of academic I am is that I teach my students how to be lawyers. And so we have real clients. And what that's meant over time is that we have represented people who have told us that they were innocent. And in some cases, we've been able to prove that and get them out of prison. Most recently, last week. <laughs> um, so we had an exoneration on the 18th and my book was published on the 19th. It was just a wild week. But the, this kind of litigation is very intensive and obsessive and it takes you all over the place and it does take you away from your family at times. And how have you personally reconciled that? How does that, how has that played itself out in your life? For a long time, I felt very guilty and in particular, when my children were little, my full-time job was in LA and we lived in San Francisco. So I was commuting every week to a job that was far away, hundreds of miles away. And I was spending three nights away from them. And they were two and four when I started. And I did that for three years. And essentially what that meant was that half the time I, I wasn't with my small children and it made me feel incredibly guilty. At the same time, they 
understood even at a young age, the kind of work that I was doing, which was again, representing people who had been wrongfully convicted. Although I don't want to make your listeners feel like, oh, you have to be doing God's work to be away from your children. I don't think that's true. It, it so happened that this was the work that I was doing. It felt deeply important. I imagine the folks who are listening to this webinar are doing work that is deeply important to them and it's all different kinds. Um, how did I reconcile it? You know, it took me a long time. And I think what really helped was that my children understood the importance of what I was doing, that I was really trying in my own small way to make the world a better place. And I tried to incorporate them into what I was doing as best as I could by kind of explaining what this struggle in court was about. And I was able to use kind of superhero analogies and talk about good and evil and justice in a way that I think even as little kids, they were able to understand. I mean, I would say some of the writing that you're doing is probably the way that you've reconciled it too, because when you feel, you know, pangs of, of guilt or negativity or miss your kids or, or conflicted in any way, but then you look at the studies and there are studies that show that, you know, there's no difference between staying at home and being a working mom in the overall, uh, impact on your children and whether or not they're successful or have behavior problems. And that ultimately it actually actually really good in terms of role modeling and women having their, your daughters having careers and sons being more available to, to participate in, in the household labor. Absolutely. And I think you touch on two important things. First of all, you're right. I really dug into the research about working mothers and what impact it had on children, because I think the conventional wisdom is that if you work outside the home, you're somehow damaging your children if you're a mother, although, of course, we don't believe that about fathers. And so there have been a number of longitudinal studies and meta-analyses done about this question, and it's just not true. It debunks that wisdom. And in fact, the daughters of working mothers tend to have more successful, happier lives on the whole and the sons of working mothers tend to be uh, men who believe in, in gender parity and are willing to take on more of the household labor. So it's actually the contrary. And I don't say this to start a mommy war. I don't think there's anything wrong with staying home if that's what you want and you can afford it. But for too long, we've made women just feel incredibly guilty about, about working, whether because they need to or they loved it or some combination. I think the other thing, though, that's interesting, and I just say this as someone who writes, is that I find the writing process to be cathartic, which is to say, when I'm troubled by an issue, in this case, my own ambition and its impacts, and then I, I, I talk to other women and I do the research, I come out of that deep dive feeling much more educated and calmer and kind of better about the whole thing. Why do we think, why do you think that ambition has such a bad rap? The idea, the word, the concept that you would be ambitious and somehow women, you, it, it, there's like a negative feeling and connotation to it. Like it's somehow some, a bad thing. I have so many questions. I wish, we, I wish we could do a poll of the people who are listening, but I want everyone listening to ask yourself, if asked, are you ambitious? What would you say? And what does that term mean to you? And I ask that rhetorically because when I interviewed women for my book, reflexively, most of them told me that they were not ambitious and that I should interview their mom or their friend who was really ambitious. And these were incredibly high achieving, successful women. And so the fact that they were shrinking away from the term didn't really make sense logically, except that women have been raised and socialized to be self-effacing, to not take credit, to worry that people will think that they are arrogant or self-aggrandizing. And so claiming that term for oneself as a woman has been something that, that has been frowned upon. And actually, it's played itself out recently in politics, where when Kamala Harris was being considered to be now president, Joe Biden's vice president, the knock on her was that she was, quote, too ambitious and would want to be president herself, which, of course, is true of every single vice president in recent history, including Joe Biden, with, I think, the exception of Dick Cheney. And ambition, all it means is wanting to be successful, striving to do well. And you would think that that would be relatively uncontroversial, and yet women really shy away from that label, and that's in part because I think, unfortunately, society punishes them when they claim it for themselves. You have one of the best definitions, I think, 
or explanations of ambition in your book. And just not definition, but I love when you wrote ambitions nonlinear and that it's like water and that it has different pressure points and that it has different temperatures and that it has different pathways as it navigates around these like immutable objects in your life, which are your children and your family and your career. And one of the reasons why we started the second shift, Gina and I, is because we saw that it's not only ambition, but that could be career, you know, that could be your journey of life and where you come in and out and that it has to be this like fluid flow because if it's just rushing water, it doesn't, it, it will barrel through all of those things and take them down. And so, um, or just explode, it doesn't work that way. Uh, I just thought that was a really a nice way of putting it. Um, so, cause, cause so many times it's like all the things I'm hearing you say and all the stories that you relate in the book, some of it, so much of it's just internalized. It's really internalized, the guilt, the, the pressure, the lack of, you know, the idea of ambition. And I know that that comes from girls being socialized and taught this at an early age and all of the inputs and all of that generational feminist and all of the feminism and all of the pressure that comes with it. We, and motherhood, all of it, 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 it like bursts in people and it becomes too much. And so I love the idea of like, how do you, Tra like transform your mind and turn something that could be guilt and negativity into something really positive. That is really the goal of the book. And I hope that for people who read it and finish it at the end, that's the transformation internally that they have, that they take the negativity and the guilt and they transform it into something positive and affirming and realize that not only is it okay to love their job, but it's actually awesome. And yes, I do like the water analogy in part because I think the other problem is that we think of ambition as something that has to be this linear upward trajectory. And that that means that you can kind of never do anything that's maybe going sideways or even maybe for some people temporarily, like in my case, going backward. And I think that that's true for a lot of moms. There's just times when there are different pressure points and you need to really focus on dealing with whatever is happening in your family or deal with whatever is coming up emotionally for you. And I wanted to really normalize that and not make it seem like, oh, if you make one mistake on this tightrope and fall off, you're just in free fall forever, right? That there's all different kinds of ways to be successful. And that I think for too long, we've been under this almost like 1950s madman type of definition, which has a lot of staying power and is really outdated. Well, it's because we live in a madman world. We live in a structure of yes. the way that workplace is built is are built around a madman world. And so there it's set up for a failure and it's set up to make you feel like shit. Yes, it is. It is. And that's that's everything from work hours being incompatible with school hours, making it impossible for you to pick up your kids and having a traditional nine to five job. It's also this idea that FaceTime, and I don't mean the kind on your iPhone saying goodnight to your kids, I mean the kind where you have to be face-to-face -face in an office is absolutely essential when we know now, especially after the pandemic, that in many ways it's not. It's a very overhyped idea or that you need a rigid schedule that has no flexibility built in or that there is sort of this looking down your nose at needing to leave because you have to pick up, for example, a sick kid. And I think the pandemic, I hope, really is a watershed moment in allowing us to dismantle some of these structures. They are dismantled, but maybe leaving them that way and rebuilding them in a way that's much more humane for working mothers. That's my hope. You and I have a very similar experience in that we have two small children and we are both divorced. So we have the, in some ways, luxury of a lot of free time. And that is, you know, when I don't have my kids, I have all the time in the world to work and to really get everything done. And it's, it, it shouldn't be that you have to have, you know, have custody to be able to deal and go to and thrive at work and get everything on your list done. It doesn't seem like a fair setup for families or single parents. I agree. It's interesting. I think when people ask me, how are you able to write books? How are you able to litigate these cases? How are you able to do X, Y, and Z? You seem so busy. I say, I'm divorced. 
And that's why, because I'm fortunate to have my former partner. I actually consider him my life partner, really, who is incredibly devoted to our kids. And it's truly 50 50. And so I'm lucky we don't we don't fight about custody. We don't fight about money. It's he doesn't give me any money, but it's not a stressful situation for me when I don't have my children. I can work just like you. And it is a really sad commentary, I think, on our society that you and I are better positioned to be productive than happily married women who are married to men, because generally speaking, they do the lion's share of the domestic labor. And so, and they don't get the time off that you and I have. And our, our society doesn't support them in any meaningful way. And it's incredibly frustrating that this has been true for hundreds of years and continues to be true. I think it's, there's also something that you wrote, I'm I'm saying here, there's like the idea, the idea that also women are very resentful because if you're doing more in the household and you have like controlling and perfectionist tendencies, then you take on more and more responsibility because you're the one who does it right. Because ambitious and successful women are like thrive on the feeling of competency and they thrive on that feeling of like control and the controlling aspect of, of, the women's personalities in a lot of ways where, you know, you, you do it best. And so you have to do all the things you have to do all the household tasks and you have to do all of the medical appointments and you have to do, you know, be there for homework time and work. And the more successful professionally and more money you make, it's like the amount of hours that men actually work in the household decreases. And it's so interesting too, the more successful and ambitious you are, the more you think, well, my kids deserve the same level of attention and care that I give to a client or a job or my patients or what have you, right? And so the idea of ceding it to a partner who you think is not going to do as good a job or might even do a lousy job is difficult for some women. And a lot of the moms that I talked to for this book said, I just know it's going to be done differently and worse. And so even though it makes me resentful, I still am the one who schedules the play dates and the doctor's appointments and the after school activities and does most of the driving because I know we'll be on time and I know we'll register in time to get a slot, et cetera. And, you know, I think the message there is that you've got to be willing to cede some of that control and live through that rocky adjustment period where the other person is, is doing it and not in a way that you would like. Um, and then hopefully they yeah, improve. Going back, to, going back to a lesson you learn the hard way when you are not with your children 50% of the time is that you have to let go of that. You learn that the hard way. And so it, you, it, it, it can be done. You can allow, you know, the wrong pants to go to school that day or the pickup to be late, um, you know, to cede a little bit of that control that is very hard. I hear this a lot from women and I hear this a lot in my own friend group that it's like, you want to do it, you want to control it, then you're resentful of that control. And the more ambitious and the more successful you are, the harder it is because it's somehow you feel like you owe it. You, you need to do more. You know, there's like this, a pressure to do a better job at everything. And I, I really don't exactly practice what I preach. I'm going to be honest. I mean, I, I, I do, a, I do almost all the play dates. I do, I, I do all the registering for camp. I fill out all the forms. I take them to the doctor. I, I wish I could say I practice what I preach, but in some respects, I don't because I'm worried if I don't register them for camp, he won't do it on time, and then they won't have any camp. And I'm just much more of a I'm just much more sort of on it in that mom way where, you know, you click on, you get the link and you do it that day. And I know, I know my former husband and I know he'll get around to it when he gets around to it. But at that point, maybe it's going to be too late. So I, I need to take my own medicine. I agree. I do too. I don't know why it's just like in, it's in our DNA in some ways, I guess. I don't know. That's probably a very gendered way of saying it, but um, you know, I think oftentimes the busier you are, the more you get done. Yes, that is 100% true. I think that there's a saying, if you want to get something done, give it to a working mother. We're ruthlessly efficient because we have to be. I mean, we do not waste a single minute. And and I think that that's something that makes us exceptionally capable, but also maybe exceptionally burdened. To, To this point... I, I love the, the line, another line from the book that says uh, the idea of work-life balance and the idea of like the selfless mother are both false gods. 
and that women are chasing after a mirage and also punishing ourselves for something that's not, it's not attainable. And so if you fail to achieve the impossible, then it's like, it's almost self-sabotaging yourself. It really is. And I think we get sold. Mentality. A hundred percent. I think we get sold a bill of goods. I think we get sold that bill of goods on Instagram and Facebook and all kinds of social media that's showing us these images of these moms who fit into their skinny jeans three hours after giving birth and are planning vacations and cooking delicious meals and being these kick-ass girl bosses. And it's just this curated image, but it's so powerful in terms of the hold that it has on us. And I think we're getting it relentlessly through celebrity messaging where these celebrities are telling us, even as they're flying all over the world and doing various acting or modeling or lifestyle jobs that they never outsource childcare and their children are the most important person in their life. And you realize that a lot of this is just, I don't know, made for us weekly fluff. And yet it makes you feel, as you say, like, like crap. And it's not, it's not accurate. It's not reality. I would wager that even some of those moms have their bad days. We just don't see them. And yeah, I mean, I definitely felt like for years I was racing around like a rat in a maze or a mouse maybe because rats are gross, trying to find a way out, right? I was thinking if I could just find this perfect balance, I will find my way out of this maze when all I was hitting were sort of booby traps and dead ends. But there is no such place. And it's it's almost like thinking that you can keep a seesaw off the ground perfectly equivalent and in perfect balance 100% of the time. And that happens like one minute of a day, right? It's almost like a stopped clock. It'll happen twice. That's it. Um, okay, last question. I'm just wondering, because so much of this was mining your own childhood and your mother and your relationships with your family, how, what was the lesson that you learned from that? And how, how did it wind up in your own family relationship? Did, it have, did you have a closure? Did you have answers to things or put pieces together in some way? You know, I really did. I mean, I, I learned a lot about my parents. I think we all think we know everything there is to know about them. But then when you interview them day after day, <laughs> hour after hour, things start coming out. And there are a couple of things I learned. I mean, one of them is that my mother never achieved her full earning power until after my last sister left the house and that she made far more professional sacrifices than I ever realized. And that I also kind of came to the realization that the person whose ambition I really emulated was my dad because I wanted his freedom, not her constraints. He traveled frequently for work. He was a trial lawyer. And he, he pursued what was important to him. And it wasn't until I sat down story at the book that I realized how similar my choices were to his, not just my choice of career, but my choice to travel for it and not apologize. And I found that recognition, I should have sort of seen it, right? And yet when I look at my path and I look at his path, they're really similar. Whereas the only time that my mom ever left the house uh, it spent a night away from us, I should say, it was when she was giving birth to one of us or two times when she took her medical boards. So I did realize a lot about my family and my family patterns. And I came away with it for, with a lot of just respect and compassion and understanding for my mom and also a much more in-depth realization of like all the compromises that she made. And she would be the first person to say that she made them willingly and that my dad is the love of her life and she's had an extremely successful career and a wonderful marriage and a wonderful family. So it's not that my mother is resentful or I judge her. It's just, there were things that I sort of assumed about her that ended up not being true. And then ways in which I thought I was modeling myself after her. And I realized, well, what I saw was a way to be that was more, that was more in some ways like my dad. Really interesting. What yeah. do they think of the book? Um, my mom, my mom was incredibly supportive and um, is it read it and is listening to it on 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 audio now for like the third time. <laughs> and my dad, I think, sort of said something like, "I understand why you think it's important to write this, even though I wouldn't, and I feel like it's too much personal information about our family." All right. Thank you so much for being here. I think in honor of Mother's Day, this is just a great conversation about motherhood and working and all the ways in which inside and outside we need to make change. So thank you so much for being here. Ambitious, 
like a mother. I'm going to put the link up. This will be on our blog. Thanks so much, Laura. It was so nice thank to meet you. you. It was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I loved being here. And thank you to everyone who came and who's going to listen. Thanks. Hold on one sec.